Well, please turn your turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter nine, and we will pick up in our scriptures that we've been studying here. And we're going to start in verse 27, and we'll read through verses uh, 27 through 31 this morning. And it says here in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. Here we are. We've read our scripture today, Matthew 9, 27 through 31. And uh, we're continuing on with the power of Jesus. And, you know, it's really important that you understand what Matthew's doing here. He's establishing Jesus as the only eligible applicant for Messiah, for king of the universe, for creator, for champion, for savior, for Lord, all the titles that our wonderful Lord carries, he's being interviewed for. That's what's happening in Israel. And it's up to you as you read through the Gospels to decide whether he was the guy and is the guy, whether you would accept him as being the true Messiah. And so that's what he's doing is he's presenting to us the readers. And he's written this to the Jews specifically. So someone who knows the Old Testament, someone who knows Jewish history, someone who knows the promises of God and his coming. Now you got to understand that there have been many, many, many applicants. There have been many men and women in history who have claimed to be the Savior, who have claimed to be the answer for humanity. And we get it every four years at election. We, you know, brace yourself. This summer... Oh, we're in for some fun, aren't we? Oh, my goodness. As we hit election season again and, and the claims begin, and the, this guy's the problem and I'm the answer. And that's just what we're going to hear constantly. But what do they do to prove it? Where is the evidence that they are who they say they are? And that's exactly what Matthew is presenting to us. The evidence that Jesus is truly the Messiah, that he has the power of God, that he is the power of God and the love of God and the saving grace of God. And so we've been going through a series of miracles that Jesus has done, displaying his power over everything, that there's nothing that he does not have control over, that he does not have authority over. There's, there's never a moment where Jesus goes, oh, yeah, that's too much for me, let's run, <laughs> and he turns and runs. He faces it head on every time, and he comes out victorious, and I love that about our Lord. In, the, in the, uh, chapter 8, we saw three miracles that displayed his power over disease, over disease, pestilence, and then we saw his power over nature and over the demonic world, the unseen, supernatural world, the angelic world. He is the Lord's captain and commander of the Lord's army. And he proves it by simply giving a command and these, this legion of demons depart from these two demonically filled men that were violent. They were violent and raging. And he just gave the word and they instantly went calm and the pigs that were there feeding on the hillside went manic panic. They went violent. They went violently running down the the uh, hillside off a cliff and into the Sea of Galilee and drowned. What a display of like, wow, that was the power that was in those guys? And you could see it and the transfer of that power. And so the disciples were amazed as they watched Jesus display his power. This chapter, what we've been seeing is uh, determination 
by those seeking Jesus. Once people began to learn who he was and began to believe, you see people seeking him in such a powerful way, an undeterred, totally determined way to reach Jesus for their healing, for their touch, for their need. Uh, And so you have these four men that lowered a friend through the ceiling as Jesus was teaching. And he displayed his power over sin. Your sins are forgiven you. And of course, the Pharisees went into a conniption fit. No one can forgive sins but God. And Jesus says, well, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or rise up and walk. Because he's laying there because of his sin. That you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He looks at the man and he says, rise up and walk. And the man leaps up out of his bed. I mean, what do you say to that? That's kind of drop the mic moment. Shut your mouth. (laughs) And we see a series of these shut your mouth moments against his adversaries, the ones who would ultimately crucify him, fully rejecting his lordship, even though he displayed his lordship over and over and over again. And so now we saw Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, seek him for his daughter's healing, and the woman who had the issue of blood, and Jesus healed them both. He cared for them both, and how powerful he is, no respecter of persons. He doesn't hold one above another. Oh, they're more important. They have more important status. They have more important influence. He cares nothing about that. Jesus loves the individual. He loves you. He cares about you. He stands with you. He hurts with you. He heals you. He restores you. And he's promised that in the end, when you stand before him, he will restore all things in your life. Everything that you've lost will be filled back up to full. In his presence is fullness of joy and life forevermore. And so now here we are in verse 27. As he leaves Jairus' house, He's leaving the house of Jairus after raising his sweet little girl, 12 years old, from the dead. He's walking out. People have no idea what just went on in that house. All they're going to know is that little girl's coming out. Not dead. Not heading for the tomb, but heading for the schoolyard or wherever they did. 12-year-old girl heading for marriage. (laughs) That was that culture, so... Crazy, I know, huh? And so t- now we're going to see here two blind men and, a, and this demonic mute man. We'll get to him next week. Right now, we're just this week, we're looking at these two blind men that seek Jesus. And it's important that you once again realize that what gave these people the faith was the scriptures. How do you know he could heal the blind? How do you know? When, when was a blind person ever healed, received their sight in history? In fact, uh, it was um, in uh, John chapter 9, the, the man who was born blind was healed. This is what he says. He says, since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. And yet he opened my eyes, and you don't know who he is. That's what he's saying to the scribes and Pharisees. They're all livid. How did you do it? How did you tell us again? Oh, do you want to become his disciples as well? Oh, you were born into sin. You wretch, don't tell us. You know, he's just looking down at him. He's like, well, I once was blind. Now I see. Has anybody ever done that before? And so once again, we see the majesty and power of God through Jesus Christ. Look at what Isaiah 29, 18 says. In that day, when the Messiah comes, that's what in that day means. The day of the Lord and in that day are two phrases throughout the Old Testament that tell us about the coming of the Messiah. That he will bring wrath and vengeance on his enemies and foes. And so it's a day of judgment, it's a day of trouble, a day of darkness, but he will deliver Israel and he will deliver the weak and the poor and the helpless. It's a day of peace. It's a day of restoration. It's a day of renewal. And this is what it says. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of the book 
and the eyes of the blind shall see out of the obscurity and out of darkness. Wow. He will restore those who have been maimed by this life, who have been hurt, who have been devastated by this life. He will bring healing and restoration. They knew it. That's who they were looking for. And when Jesus is walking around doing exactly that, oh, they knew who he was. They knew who he was. They started recognizing this is our Messiah. Isaiah 35, 5 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. He will not only heal the people, he will heal the landscape. He's going to be a great landscape artist. Every backyard will be beautiful when Jesus is done. <laughs> ah, funny thought. Um, but true. But true. And so now we come to our scripture here today. Verse 27. When Jesus departed from there, that is the house of Jairus, Two blind men followed him, crying out. That word crying out in the, in the Greek is, is, is the most dramatic. It's, it's with emphasis. They were wailing, hooting, hollering, anything to get his attention. And they are crying, son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. This is, this is a very, very profound uh, statement that they are claiming publicly, openly, Though these two men are physically blind, they spiritually see. There are two forms of blindness. There is a blindness that is physical, which is a picture of the spiritual blindness that this world possesses, dwelling in darkness and without light. Those who cannot see God or believe in him are blind. There's a spiritual blindness in our world, and it is amazing that when your eyes have been opened and you see so clearly the displayed glory of God in everyday life, how do you deny the existence of God when you've witnessed a sunrise or a sunset? When you've witnessed the, 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 the uh, flora in full bloom in the spring? When you've seen the seasons in their glory? When you've witnessed the, the majesty of a lightning storm? Or the intricacy of snow. We got to go to the snow this week, didn't we? A lot of us. Live, if you live, uh, well, it snowed here. We were out here watching the snow come down this week going, wow, this is awesome. And you know, every single snowflake is unique. There's not one, there's not two that are alike. Every single snowflake is unique and different. And how can you say, well, yeah, that was just chance. Have you ever witnessed birth? Oh my goodness. When I saw my son, my firstborn son born, I was like, how could there even be doubters in this room? When you see life just spring forth from life, it's incredible. Or animals give birth in the, in the wilderness or in your closet, like our cat did. <laughs> Sweetest, oh man, when they give birth in your closet, they are your friend. Oh man, our cat... She was born in our closet, and she likes us. We are mommy and daddy to her, and we always will be. And uh, so when you witness things like this, it's like, how could you question the reality of God, the majesty of God, the, the presence of God, the, the plan of God, when you see a believer go to be with him? And there's some powerful moments. My goodness. When Jesus comes for his saints at death, it is sweet, and it is sweet to watch. Smiles, peace, joy. It's unexplainable. Tacitus, a Roman historian who witnessed thousands of martyrs as Christians were killed at the lions, were, were tortured and killed, he said it is unexplainable the difference between a Christian and anyone else. He says, you cannot explain the difference. He said, they die in ecstasy and in peace, as if it were not pain but pleasure. They didn't ask for it. They're not masochists. They didn't 
push their way in. Yeah, kill me and make, a, make it so it happened. They just wouldn't deny Jesus as Lord. And Jesus met them in that moment and took care of them and walked them into heaven. And he, as a historian, saw the power of that and wrote about it. I, that's just fascinating. So, <clears throat> yeah, Joyce, Joyce, we are praying for you. Joyce has uh, fighting cancer. It sprung back up. But you know what? Jesus has his hand on you. And when it's your time to go be with him, it's your time to go be with him. You get to go into glory. I'm jealous. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'll beat you there. You never know. <laughs> but... Whenever it's our time, man, I'm telling you, don't hesitate. Run. Run into glory. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen? Uh, it's just awesome, our God. Now, I want you to see the power of these men's statement and how much they saw. Though they were blind, how much did they see? They called Jesus the son of David. That is not normal, okay? People didn't go around in the time of Christ or any other time just, you know, crying out, son of David, son of David. That is a messianic term. That is a prophetic term about the Messiah, about the king, about the coming ruler of the universe, God himself. He would be known as the son of God, he would be known as the son of David. And those phrases were equal. They were interchangeable. In fact, when um, is it Caiaphas asked Jesus on trial, he says, are you the Mashiach, the son of God? One and the same. Meant the same thing. And Jesus said, you said it. And he tore his clothes and he said, what more do we need to hear? This man should die. And they all spat in his face and slapped him on the cheek. Hmm. Sacrificial lamb. How do you transfer sin? By laying your hands on him. And they all, the elders of Israel, all the elders of Israel that were there, because obviously Nicodemus was not approving, Joseph of Arimathea not approving, this was a nighttime trial. It was illegal. But those who were there laid their sin on the face of the Son of God and then sent him off to the Romans. And so powerful when you think of this phrase, Son of David. Look at this in Psalm 89. This is the prophecy concerning the Son of David. And, and even before that, I'll just mention um, 2 Samuel chapter 7 is where God makes the promise to David that his offspring from his body would rule and reign forever, and of his kingdom there would be no end, and that his, it was an everlasting kingdom. And David just sat there before the Lord in worshipful praise, saying, who am I? And, and, and who are my family and my people that we should receive such a gift from you? He was just absolutely blown away by the mercy of God in this gift. And this is what it says in Psalm 89, 34. My covenant I will not break, nor after alter, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithfulness, the faithful witness in the sky. Wow, the sun and moon will last forever. That's what that just says. And it will last, uh, Jesus' reign will last as long as the sun and the moon. So, you know, the new heavens and the new earth will possess the sun and the moon that we're familiar with. Yeah. According to that scripture right there, I, I don't mess with it. Don't mess with it. You gotta, you gotta put all the puzzle pieces together. You know, but wait, it says a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, the old things were passed away. Uh, yeah, how about you're a new creation? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. What old things? Sin, death, disease, sorrow, suffering. Yeah, that's the list that is given in Revelation chapter 21. All that stuff's passed away. The new heavens and the new earth is filled with the glory of God and the permanence of God, and he died for his whole creation, for God so loved the cosmos, for God so loved the world. That's John 3, 16. 
The cosmos is the Greek word there. It means all of creation. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life, or everlasting life. Hallelujah. Isaiah 9, you guys are familiar with this one. Every Christmas, this one comes out. Um, it says this in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from, the time, this time, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You see, it will be the kingdom of David upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. This Messiah will rule and reign. So what these men are saying is, you're the one, you're the one, you're the one, the promised one, the one who's to come. Zechariah 13, 1 says, in that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. This Messiah Zechariah says, will cleanse the house of David and cleanse Jerusalem. They will be washed, cleansed, and made right before God. Wow, how clear is that? There is more than just a physical healing. There's more than just a victory in battle. There is a cleansing of the inner heart and soul of human beings that was coming out of your innermost being shall uh, spring up torrents of living water. Matthew twenty two forty two. This is uh, Jesus asked the scribes and Pharisees, all right, you guys, come on. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Who's the, who, whose son is the, is the Christ? They said to him, the son of David. It's as clear as, as that. It's, he's the son of David. He will be born in Bethlehem. That's what the scripture says. And it's exactly who Jesus was. They're, they're talking to the Son of God. And they're saying, yeah, well, he'll be the Son of David. And what's everybody been calling me for all these years? The Son of David. Luke 1, this is what Gabriel says to Mary. Gabriel comes to Mary and he says, he will be great. This child that's going to be more, born miraculously through your womb. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Mary was a descendant of David himself. There's the genetic connection. Mary was a descendant of David himself, and so was Joseph. He was of the house and lineage of David. And so even in his legal right to the throne through adoption, Joseph is directly related to Solomon and to uh, David. But there is a man in his lineage that disqualified him from being genetically related to Jesus. Have you ever known that? Jeconiah was a wicked man. And the prophet said, I will remove Jeconiah from the lineage of the Messiah. He will not be in the inheritance. And guess what? Mary is not related to Jeconiah. And Jesus was born of Mary. And so there is a ge genetic disconnect. His blood does not flow um, through Solomon and down through Jeconiah. His is through Nathan, the son of David. Isn't that fascinating? What a, what a fun surprise in heaven, you know, being the brother of Solomon. Nathan was his full brother from Bathsheba. And you get to heaven and you go, What? He's related to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take that, Solomon. <laughs> okay, so he will, be, uh, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Wow, powerful. This is what uh, uh, Zechariah the prophet, uh, or priest, Zechariah, well, he's also a prophet. He prophesies right here. Zechariah prophesies in the temple, um, um, actually, uh, he's not in the temple at this moment. He's, he prophesies at the birth of John, when John the Baptist is born. This is what he says about the Messiah, verse 68 of Luke 1. 
Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He knew Mary's lineage. Zechariah did. They, it was their responsibility to track lineages in Israel. And he knew that Mary was a daughter of David and her son would be the son of David. And that's what he's prophesying. So you see how big this is, that these guys that are following Jesus are declaring this. You're the Messiah. You're the son of David. You're the son of God. We believe it. We know it. Even into Revelation, Jesus will carry his heritage and his name into eternity. Revelation 5.5, 5, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. You know what I love about that line? Think about that. How could David's offspring be his root? It's, it's the deity of Christ, all in one with the, uh, the, the genetic connection. Oh, he's David's son, but he's also David's father. He is the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Of his kingdom, there shall be no end. You see, that's the mystery. And that's what that's declaring. He's the root of David, the source. No, you know, we would say fruit, not root. But he's both, the fruit and the root. That's the mystery of God in Jesus Christ. Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16, I, Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. There it is. Root and fruit. The bright and morning star. Jesus says it himself. I am before David. I am after David. I am the alpha and the omega. The first and the last. That's who Jesus is and how awesome it is to see that. And these guys, as they pursued Jesus, proclaimed it. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us, is what the blind men call, uh, cry out as Jesus is heading from Jer uh, Jericho to Jerusalem. Bar uh, Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, and a friend of his, a companion of his, crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And these blind men are saying the same thing here. And you've got to understand, they have a spiritual sight that the blind Pharisees did not have. Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides. You are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the ditch. And so uh, that's the reality in this situation as they are seeing exactly who Jesus is and pursuing him. Let's read on. Um, it says, well, have mercy on us. Let's not miss that part. Have mercy on us. This is also a very important element because you see, this is something a Pharisee wouldn't have prayed. Their theology was you earn your way to heaven. And if you're a Pharisee and you call yourself a Pharisee, then you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job earning your way to heaven. You are self-righteous. These guys aren't saying, uh, Son of David, get over here and heal us. We're deserving. Mercy is getting what you, or not getting what you de uh, don't deserve. Right. Yes. Not getting what you deserve. That's mercy. I slept in today. <laughs> so it's not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And mercy and grace are sweet sisters that the Lord has granted to us that we would not receive the wrath of God and get hell. These guys weren't born uh, or, or blind and saying, we don't deserve this. They're saying the opposite. Have mercy on us. Their statement is, Lord, we deserve what we got, but will you have mercy on us? Will you have mercy on us? Why would they seek this Messiah for mercy? Wouldn't he be the Pharisee of Pharisees? Wouldn't he be the greatest? Actually, no. According to Scripture, it's the opposite. He would be incredibly merciful 
Have mercy. Mercy is a foundational truth of God's nature. He is a merciful God. I want you to see this. Psalm 145.8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. This is who God is. If you know God, you know he's merciful. You know you can run to him. He will not turn you away. He will embrace you. He will love you. Daniel, as he sought the Lord in Daniel chapter 9, he says, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation. And the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds. Not as a Pharisee. Not because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Lord, we don't deserve it, but will you give it? Will you grant it in your mercy? Have mercy. Have mercy on us. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. That is how these men were approaching. This was a, a, a salvation moment. They had their theology totally right. They spiritually saw better than, than most of those around them. They saw who Jesus was and what he was able to do, and they pursued him. Lamentations 3, I love this one. Jeremiah the prophet writes this, though through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. How could you not pursue a loving God like that? That's why these guys were so ready. You know, this carries over into Jesus' ministry, and you see this just from his ministry in life. Titus 3, Titus 3, Paul writes to Titus, and he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You've been saved by his mercy. We don't sit here claiming to be holier than thou or righteous. The righteous. Here's the righteous people of the foothills. Welcome. Oh, please. We are here because of the mercy of God through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. God in his mercy has granted the believer his Holy Spirit as a down payment, as an engagement ring. As a promise keeper, he's given you his Holy Spirit to say, I will complete the work I've begun in you. I'm going to complete it. I will, I will not fail to give you all that I've promised. Oh, yes, thank you, Lord. Take that to uh, any bank. That's good. Yeah. Any bank that's of God. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 2.17, Therefore, in all things, he, that is Jesus, had to be made like his brethren, that's us. He had to be made like us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. In order for Jesus, as Messiah, to have mercy on us, he had to be made like us and then die for us. That's what propitiation means. He had to be the blood sacrifice for you and I. In order to do that, he had to be made like us. He couldn't just do that from heaven. Hey, guys, check it out. Did you see that star? It just faded and then poof, reappeared. Yeah, that was the death and resurrection of the Son of God. It's not how he did it, is it? He did it right here in real time in history. As Luke writes to us in Acts chapter 1, God has given us many infallible proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses, we saw him, we handled him, we ate with him, we hung out with him. On and off for 40 days, we know he's alive. And they died for that truth. That's how convinced they were. It's powerful, super powerful. He is the full propitiation so that he might have mercy on us. Without that, there could be no mercy. And so these men understood that they could approach Jesus, who was the Messiah, the Son of God, and they would approach him in his mercy and not in their own righteousness. Sounds like a Christian to me. 
Sounds like God was already at work in their hearts to receive the fullness of what God was offering. Let's move on to verse eight, uh, 28. Matthew 9, 28. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. Now, <laughs> this cracks me up. Okay, so it says the house. That means this is the house where Jesus was staying. Which house was Jesus staying at? No idea. If I was to guess, Peter's house, right? Because in chapter 8, on the Sabbath, Jesus came into Peter's house and healed his mother-in-law. And so, uh, you know, that was his headquarters was Capernaum. And it would seem that, that Jesus stayed with Peter while in Capernaum and that he stayed with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus when he went down to Jerusalem, in Bethany there, right above on the Mount of Olives. And so those, those are the two houses that are mentioned in Scripture where Jesus stayed at. And so it was most likely Peter's house. He could have stayed with someone else, but it calls it the house, the house. And so he comes into the house, and check it out. The blind men came to him. What? Wait a minute. I mean, think that through. These are two strangers who've been pursuing Jesus in the streets, which is odd. He didn't stop for him. He went into the house. What? I'm telling you, God works in strange and mysterious ways. You think, well, why wouldn't Jesus, when he heard them, turn around and minister to him like he did the woman with the issue of blood? He has his reasons. I could think of lots of reasons. One, he didn't want to do it publicly. He wanted to do it privately. It makes sense for what he says to him at the end here. Uh, he, he, he wanted that intimate uh, moment. He also wanted them to deepen in their faith and determination. They kept pursuing, and he knew they had the faith for it. Oh, they were coming, and they were coming hard, and nothing was going to stop them. They were, I mean, they were blind already. How do you make it through the crowd and keep pushing in? I mean, it's pretty awesome that that's what happens. But uh, it also shows us the openness of Jesus. How many of you would react like this if someone came into your house? You know, hey, can you uh, wait until I'm not in my house? Like when a salesperson comes to your door soliciting, something you're absolutely not interested in. You know, what, are you patient? <laughs> Do you uh, witness? Look at what Jesus does. Amy and I were on the island, Catalina Island, and, and we were staying in a parsonage above the church. And uh, the, the, it's small town, and the church was almost like a chamber of commerce, if you will. When people would come over to the island, you know, and wanted to find something out and, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce kept regular business hours. <laughs> They'd come to us. <laughs> you, were, you were part tour guide, part pastor. It was like there was all kinds of people coming and milling and, and always people there and always noisy. It was a rough place to live. I, I said to Amy, I, this is not my calling. This is, this is so not my calling. I'm not a parsonage type person, you know, out watering the lawn where the whole congregation drives by, you know, hey. Hey, hey, you know, need those quiet moments, you know, the Lord knows what we need. But it amazes me, this is Jesus. He's living in this kind of condition where privacy, personal space, I think not. He's thronged and squeezed by the crowd. He gets into the house and people are following him into the house. And he doesn't kick them out or drive them out. We were, one morning, we were uh, in bed in our house Somebody had forgotten to lock the door because all of a sudden, Amy and I are waking up and we were talking, we we're facing each other, talking in bed, and there was a strange man standing at the foot of my bed. <laughs> now, at any other environment, I would have been freaked out grabbing for a weapon, right? But it's Catalina. You're like, can I help you? <laughs> yeah, I heard there was a really good tour. <laughs> I was like, dude... You're in my bedroom. <laughs> it is seven in the morning. My kids are still sleeping. He walked, he walked up the stairs, through the living room and kitchen, down the hall, to the very back bedroom, past the bathroom. This guy had some audacity. Chutzpah is what a Jew would say. Uh, had some chutzpah. I'm like, dude, I, I don't know. You need to go. Let's... <laughs> You need to go. I see. I'm not Jesus. I'm not going to lay hands on you right now <laughs> and heal you of anything. I'm going your way. 
And uh, <laughs> anyway, it amazes me the patience of the Lord, because what does Jesus do? He says here verse, in verse 28, Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Sounds like an odd question, doesn't it? Well, we've just pushed down through the crowd, screaming, the son of David, son of David, have mercy on us. And we've pushed into your house. Here we are. Now nah, we don't believe you can do this. That's not what Jesus is asking. And I want you to notice this. This is a very audacious statement right here. Did you notice he didn't say, do you believe God could do this? Do you believe God could work through me to do this? He didn't say that. This, he, this is a deity statement right here. If you're paying attention and you understand Jewish theology, you understand biblical theology, Jesus is claiming to be God right here and he's calling him on it. Do you believe that I, in my person, can do this? This is my power. No other healer in the Bible ever used these words. Elisha and Elijah and the miracle ministries they had, it was all through God and everybody knew it. They were prophets of God, they were representatives of God, and God was doing what he wanted to do through them. Peter, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. It was in the name of Jesus that he healed. Paul did the same thing. In the authority and power of Jesus Christ, be healed. Jesus says to them, do you believe that I can do this? This is, this is Jesus saying, I'm God. Are you aware of that? You've called me the son of David. Are you aware that I am the son of God? He's deepening their theology. Because what do they respond they said to him, yes, Lord. They took it right to the level Jesus called them to. Do you believe that I can do this? Yes, Lord. That is the Greek word for God, kurios. Yes, Lord, you can do this. That was a, a word reserved by the Jew. Now, the Greeks used it for many gods and many magistrates because they would consider their... Caesar God, but not a Jew. He reserved that word for God himself. He is the Kyrios. He is the son. Uh, he is God. And so, wow, wow, wow. I love this. Look at John 8, 12. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says to them, I am the light of the world, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And they're questioning it. They're prodding at him. And they're, ah, how do we know that's true? He keeps opening the eyes of the blind. Get a clue. Does light and sight have anything relatable or in common? Yeah. If you don't have sight, you don't see light. And if you don't have light, it don't matter if you have sight. So he says, I am the light of the world. And to prove it, he heals the blind man. And I already told you that, that in chapter 9, same scenario, these same guys who are arguing with Jesus in chapter 8 see him heal a blind man in chapter 9 and questioning, how did he do it? How did he do it? He just said he's the light of the world. What are you not getting here? He healed him, and then the guy says, when has anybody ever in history been healed who was born blind? Receive their sight. It's, it's not possible. The eye is so complex. Trillions of sensors firing at the same time to create sight. If you miss a half of them, a quarter of them, a fraction of them, you don't have sight. They all have to fire in unison together to create the picture, the image. On the back of your brain, it all has to work and function together. And sight is complicated. And so someone born blind, that's a recreation of the, the entire eye. That's not just a, a retina surgery and transplant or a cataract removal. The things that we can do nowadays, they're cool, but they're not God. 
when he can produce sight out of someone who never even had it. That's incredible. And so he says, I am the light of the world. And he's calling him to this level of belief. And so verse 29, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith, you believe I'm the Messiah, the son of God. You believe I have the power to give you sight. You believe I have the power to save you. According to your faith, so be it. Let it be. Wow. I don't know, if you're not paying attention, I'm sorry, you're missing it. This is huge right here. This should be pricking your heart. You know how many times I have heard somebody say to me, I wish I had your faith? I wish I had your faith. I'm serious. At least a half dozen times when I've been in conversation with people about the Lord. Man, I wish I had your faith. I would love to believe like you believe. I just can't. The thing is, is that God is no respecter of persons. I'm not unique. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. If you would pursue, you would believe. To know him is to believe in him. Open up the word of God and begin reading. Ask him to give you faith, to give you sight. Spiritual sight. He can heal the blind, the atheist, the agnostic. You don't have to stay that way. You don't have to stay in the dark and confused. God can turn the light on, and it comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. It is a gift of God, right? It is a gift of God. And he says to them, well, as you believe, so receive. As you believe. That's our connection. You see, faith is not the power. It's the conduit. Think of faith like a bucket dipping down into the well of salvation and bringing up its waters to you. That's faith, the bucket. It's not the source itself. It's what brings that source to you personally. It's the purse. It's the wallet. It's not the money. The purse, the wallet is only as great as the money. If you have an empty wallet, it's not a great wallet. If your faith is empty and in the wrong stuff, it's nothing. It's nothing. Just have faith. Just believe. Empty if you don't have God in your wallet. Sounds like a commercial, doesn't it? (laughs) Carry God in your wallet. So if you have God, then it's his greatness. Jesus says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Any mountain that would be in your way, the mountain of salvation, the mountain of forgiveness of sins, the mountain of being right with God, the mountain of being healed, the mountain of eternal life, the mountain of fellowship and communion with God, knowing God. These are mountains, and if you just have the faith of a tiny little speck of a mustard seed, it's enough because it's in God. It's in his son, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you came to the right place with the right amount of faith. Exactly how you believed, you will receive. And he touched and healed them. Verse 30, their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see that no one knows it. And so, uh, wow. Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him that is God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Oh, brothers and sisters, pursue God in faith. You've got to guard it. This is where our human responsibility comes. God has the gift of faith for you. The gift of faith, it's right there. And how you get it is you go get it. You go get it. God says to Joshua, Everywhere you place your foot, I'm giving to you. I've given you victory over your enemies. Now go fight them. Wait a minute. I thought you said you'd given me victory over my enemies. That's right. Now go fight them. 
Well, that sounds like I got to do it. Yes, but I've given you victory. You will win. He said it before you went and did it. You knew the end of the battle before you began the battle. And that is exactly what salvation is. He's saying, go get it. Go get your salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What do you mean? I thought it was grace. Yes, go get grace. Go get grace. Go get mercy. Pursue the Lord. Run to him. Don't feed yourself the lies of this world, the doubters, those who will never believe and never confess and never receive. They are just doubters. They're blind and they're blind guides, and they're saying, come on, follow me, I've got the answer, and you watch this on TV, and you watch this in the movies, and you, you, you hear it at work, and you hear it at school, and, and you just go, go, go. It's constantly these voices that give you doubt, that give you fear. That's all they can feed you, because that's all they have. You have to decide, I am going to build a fence around my faith. I'm going to guard my faith. I'm not going to let every word that I hear come in to the faith zone. I'm going, to let, I'm going to let the word of God repel those words that are not from him. When there is a false word coming into my heart and my life, I will rebuke it in Jesus' name by the power of his word, and I will bring the scriptures that clarify and contradict that false statement. This is important. According to your faith. According to your faith, so receive. It is a blessing to pursue the Lord and guard it. Man, when I start watching something that starts attacking the faith too much, if I don't get up and walk out, I emotionally do. I just shut down. Like, I'm done listening to that garbage. They're preaching a false gospel that has no hope. It's not a, even gospel at all. Gospel means good news, and there's no good news in that. Yes, we're all evolving, and you will be a part of the next generation's continuance. Sacrifice for nothing. It's like, what? That's the gospel according to the humanist? According to the evolutionist? That's the gospel? Be a part of something bigger than you. How about be a part of something bigger than you forever? Be a part of God's kingdom. Be a part of his work. Not only will he use you to further his kingdom, but you'll get to enjoy it while you're at it. I mean, it's, there's nothing like it. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Go get the gift. You got to receive the gift. The word of God, the Bible, is a gift. It is a gift been given to us, and it is a shame that we would neglect it for entertainment. I'd rather watch something than read. Well, praise God for chosen, you know, at least to get your appetite wet for the word of God. It's not scripture. It's based on scripture and has a lot of loosey-goosey input but it's powerful, and it does. It points you to God, and people are starting to read their Bibles because of it, and that's what I love about it. Like, yeah, support that ministry. Pray for that ministry. That's an, that's an awesome ministry, reaching out to millions, millions on this planet, and if it can get us in the Word of God and growing in the Word of God, oh, precious people, get into the Word of God that your faith might grow and that faith, well, it's a gift of God. So don't say, well, I, I went out and I earned it. I memorized the Bible. Good for you. I'm not even capable of such things. But I can read it. By his grace, I can listen to it. We have no excuse nowadays. You download 10, 100 apps that all read the Bible to you. It's awesome. All right. Wrap it up. Here we go. Verse 30 and 31. Their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. Okay. <laughs> What's going on here? You know, Jesus says this multiple times. See that no one knows it. He said it to Jairus and his family. 
And the disciples, they said, keep your mouth shut until after I rise again from the dead. Uh, uh, okay. They didn't even take in, oh, that's got to happen? That means you got to die to rise. You know, they didn't put that together. But he says this to multiple people. I'm doing this for you, but don't declare it. And yet other times he does completely public miracles, absolutely public. What's the difference? Well, we're left to speculate. I just warn you right there. I'm, it's, we're left to speculate. It never stops to say, and this is why he said that. But I think we can, we can build a pretty good case for his thinking. And in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus is walking with his disciples and they're in Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi in the north of north, northern Israel. And he says to them, who do men say that I am? And they begin giving all the explanations, prophet, Jeremiah, uh, Elijah back from the dead. Yeah, we've heard it all. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ or the Mashiach, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And then the conversation goes on, but this is what he does. He stops and he says this right here. He commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. I don't want you proclaiming this yet. God has his timing. God's timing was perfect. There was a moment when Jesus was to be declared as the Messiah, and that was on the day of his triumphal entry. When he entered into Jerusalem, it was to be declared publicly, profoundly, by all those who had been healed by him. Even Lazarus was in the procession as they declared, this is the son of David. Save now, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was the time. And what would that produce? The cross. It was that moment right there that pushed those Pharisees, the Sadducees, those religious leaders. They said, we got to kill this guy as quickly as possible and as soon as we can. The whole world's going after him. We can't sit around waiting anymore. We got to get that guy and we got to get him now. Jesus knew that that was the timing. So when somebody confessed him as these men, son of David, have mercy on us. Don't advertise that reality right there. He never denied it ever. He confirmed it through his power and his work, but he said, don't advertise it. It's not time. It is not time. And so God's timing, even in our lives, we must be patient for what God wants to do through us and how he wants to use us. You know, um, I've had lots of discouraging moments in ministry where I have felt like nothing is happening. And am I even supposed to do this? Am I working outside of the will of God? I'm not seeing fruit. And I've had a lot of pastor friends who have expressed the same sentiment. Like, should I quit? It's a blessing being where I am now because I know it's, no, don't quit. You've got to keep preaching the word in season and out of season. Stand fast in the truth. It's not an easy road God called you to. It's not a popular road, but it's a blessed road and you've got to stick with it. God has his timing and his plan will be performed. And so we as a church, we're in his hands and we wait on him and we trust in his timing for the work that he has us to do. Don't get discouraged when it seems like the whole world's shifting the other way, the world is fickle and flighty. And God can turn and change the direction of the world moving towards him, but it won't last. They will turn around again. And so he has his timing and he'll use you to call others into his kingdom. So trust him with that timing and that work. Conclusion. Hallelujah, we did it. Jesus, the son of David, will have mercy on us who come to him believing, come to him trusting, come to him with faith. 
Lord, I believe you are who you say you are. Can you work in my life individually, personally, in a way that will bring life to me and to those around me? That's what we see here today, the faithfulness of our God. Well, Lord, as we're just here before you with this message, Lord, it's time for us to respond. We'd be foolish not to respond to this. Lord, some of us need to repent from sins we've entangled ourselves in. Some of us need to just confess for the first time that you are Lord and ask for your forgiveness and your grace and your love in our lives. Wherever we're at, whatever's going on, some of us just need to reaffirm that conviction that we've been walking in for the last umpteen years. Reaffirm the fact that you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you have the power to heal and to save. And there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And you will turn no one away who comes to you. So with those kinds of odds, Lord, we come to you boldly. We come to you with open hearts and open lives. And we say, Lord, please work in us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Why don't we pray together um, as a church? Let's pray together. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I'm absolutely convinced that I've sinned against you, but that you're merciful and gracious. And you've given your son, Jesus, to die in my place. I ask you to forgive all my sin. Cleanse me and purify me. Grant me enough faith to believe you for everything you have for my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might be thoroughly convinced and empowered for the work you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen.